A truce between Israel and the Palestinian armed group Islamic Jihad came into effect on Saturday night with an Egyptian-mediated ceasefire. After five days of fighting, many people in Gaza have been left without a home. The violence began on Tuesday when Israeli air raids killed three senior Islamic Jihad commanders. At least 33 Palestinians and one Israeli have been killed. This was the worst conflict between Israel and Gaza since the 10-day war in 2021. We've got two correspondents on the story. Mohammed Jamjoum standing by in West Jerusalem. First, we're going to go to Willem Max in Gaza. Uh, Willem, Gaza has been through, as we were saying, several days of attacks. What's the atmosphere like now? Well, Rob, we arrived here from southern Israel over the course of this morning. You can probably hear behind me traffic is pretty busy down on the street, a few stories beneath us. Stores have reopened, traders are on the streets, trucks bringing supplies in and out of the strip are operational once again. Even the fishermen have been allowed to go back out into the eastern Mediterranean to try and catch their fish to sell in the market. Over the course of those five days, from Tuesday through until late last night, we saw more than 1,000 rockets launched from this territory, more than 300 airstrikes targeting individual places around the Strip. The consequences for people here, as you can imagine, pretty significant. We've seen more than 30 people killed, the majority of those here in Gaza City, and then more than 170 or so injured as well. There are many people here who have been impacted by this, their homes destroyed, some of their loved ones lost, and so they'll be looking to try and rebuild over the coming weeks, months, and indeed years, Rob. And obviously, this is a situation that we've seen so many times before between Israel and Gaza. What do we expect to happen over the next few days? Well, what we would ima imagine is that the, uh, the authorities here inside Gaza will be working with those families as a priority who've been made homeless to try and figure out where they can be placed, trying to essentially refit some of the businesses that will have been damaged, try and get supplies flowing back into the various stores so that people have access to the products that they need. Of course, the longer term question is going to be around whether this kind of ceasefire that's been put in place late, late last night can hold, what the position of the various factions inside Gaza will be when it comes to their relationship with the Israeli military. William, thank you very much indeed. William, William Marks talking to us uh, from Gaza. I want to bring in Mohammed Jamjum. He's going to be talking to us from West Jerusalem. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, obviously leading uh, a coalition which is, has a very strong far-right element to it. There's a lot of speculation about how much pressure he'd been under to agree to this ceasefire. What are we hearing from Israeli authorities? Well, Rob, let me tell you first about what we've just heard in the past few minutes. Uh, speaking uh, before the weekly cabinet meeting, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made some remarks about uh, what the Israelis are calling Operation Shield and Arrow, the campaign that had been conducted in Gaza the past several days. The prime minister called it a perfect campaign. He said that due to that campaign, Israel had changed the equation between it and the uh, factions inside of Gaza. Uh, he said that his initial instructions to the army were two things, surprise and a preemptive initiative. Uh, he said that um, they had succeeded with the mission. He thanked uh, the army, the security forces, and the intelligence officials for carrying out this mission successfully. Uh, and he also said that all the top leadership of Islamic Jihad was eliminated as a result of that operation in Gaza. Now, as you said, uh, the prime minister has been under different types of pressure. Uh, on the one hand, he was under pressure from the far-right members of his coalition uh, in order to act more aggressively toward the factions, and we saw him do that in the past several days as a result of this campaign. Now, there was also pressure during the campaign from members of those communities in the south of Israel on the border with Gaza, because you saw mass evacuations over the course of the last several days. You saw tens of thousands of people leave their homes. Uh, they were starting to get worried that this was going to escalate further. They want to see their kids back in school. They want to be able to go back to their work, open their businesses again. So that was another type of pressure. But also there had been another type of pressure going on internally behind the scenes, because even though this campaign was going on, 
When you looked at what the Israeli officials were telling local media outlets, it was clear that Israel wanted there to be a ceasefire. And one of the reasons for that is they did not want to see Hamas get involved in any kind of retaliatory strikes. According to intelligence officials in Israel, they never believed that Hamas were actually inserting themselves in that fight that was going on the past several days. They were worried about it. They were worried about escalation. They kept warning Hamas not to enter the fray uh, because they knew that if that had been the case, then this was going to be a much wider wider conflagration. So those are the types of pressures that the prime minister was under. Right now, what you see is essentially him coming out saying that quiet will be met with quiet. And he's essentially saying Israel will continue to defend itself if there's a threat. And right now, basically what he's doing is addressing the country and essentially taking a victory lap, saying that what they've done, as far as he's concerned, is protect Israeli citizens. Mohammed Jamjoum in West Jerusalem. Mohammed, thank you very much. Indeed.